I'm Mark Dresner, and this is Research TV, brought to you by the Market Research Event, the largest and most comprehensive conference in the world dedicated to increasing the business value of insights. Joining me today is George Ruiz. He is partner and director of media analytics for NEO at Ogilvy. George, welcome to Research TV. Pleasure, Mark. Let's get started with a little bit about cross-media, because I know Absolutely. that that's a huge area for you. How do you go beyond purchase intent uh, in cross-media surveys, for example? Right. There's you know, television, print, TV, well, digital, social, mobile. You have this issue of tell me what the incrementality of you know, awareness or consideration, favorability, purchase intent. And these are all studies and methods that we have very good methods for executing. And we can actually uh, we can execute our brand studies fairly well mm -hmm. and with our research partners who are fantastic in helping us to execute these pieces. Mm -hmm. But I have to go beyond that because I also have this other component to look at, which is how is it selling or how is it moving actual um, uh, like acquisition numbers. Mm -hmm. Three three approaches that I like to use with with cross media data. So and, and by cross media uh, I mean those uh, brand studies where you actually uh, are able to create a design of experiments mm -hmm. that you have an exposed group of your media plan mm -hmm. and a control group that is in that media plan but doesn't see your ads. So that means, let's say if I'm on Yahoo, I'm able to actually tag and meter my banners that I buy on Yahoo, but I'm also able to measure people that consume media on Yahoo but never see those ads. Right. So that way it's a very simple, here's my control, 10% purchase rate versus exposed group, 15% purchase rate. My mm -hmm. significant delta is what I contribute to my banner ads. Imagine that effect or that, that structure, but you just repeat it across online, TV, print, and then you say TV plus online, online plus print, and then you're able to say what, what has the highest lifts and to what extent can you combine reach and frequency beyond it. So three things that I like to do. The first one is, um, and this works great when you have time-sensitive time purchases, so mm -hmm. think of like inter entertainment vertical. So when you're trying to do tune-in metrics or, or purchase metrics, um, where when you send a, uh, this cross-media studies, um, if you actually are able to send out the surveys and tag all your media to where you can recognize it the day after the event or the day after the show or something that's I immediate enough, mm -hmm. you can actually ask the purchase questions itself. So, you, so you'll just, it's simple as you add one extra question, mm -hmm. that's about the, the purchase. But because it's time sensitive to a, to a high attitudinally sensitive metric, mm -hmm. you'll be able to get out a really nice read of people that actually bought it um, within, you know, you have to sample it within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. But the reason why that's important is because you want to be able to actually then translate that number into an estimated ROI within the survey data. And that's important nice. because a lot of my clients, they'll be asking a very simple question is, so that's great that you have a 12% delta in your cross-media study. What does that mean for me? Mm -hmm. I have to essentially translate the 12% delta into some sort of an estimated ROI. If I know, if you tell me how many units you sold or how many events actually got attended, if I have the advertising cost and I have the average revenue per unit and I have the delta and the reach numbers, I can translate that 12% into, let's say, a, you know, a 1.2 ROI. Mm -hmm. Now, that's still self-respondent data, but it's because within the context of time-sensitive attentiveness, mm -hmm. I can feel so much sure that that estimate number is proportional. Then, so, so that, that's one way to go beyond purchase intent when you still have survey-only data. The next one is if you actually have, let's say, cross-media uh, study data, um, and you actually have the ability to map to, to match to a sales panel, which we all like to link cookie data together from sure. exposure panel to sales panel data. Um, it's and this is particularly um, very very scalable now in the in the CPG world, in consumer packaged goods, because mm -hmm. that's where the biggest scale and demand has been. So it's a matter of combining your digital exposure data with your sales panel data, and whatever sample you get. You could try to find ways to model or uh, essentially solve backwards for your offline exposure data. So if I know that my online sample had a 25% sales lift, and I know all my cross-media data for my other channels, how can I do it some sort of like a conditional uh, probability models mm -hmm. to solve backwards and say, if my delta for this channel is X and I know all my conditions for the other ones, solve your way backwards. That's a nice way to, to leverage solutions available today. Mm -hmm. Now, but, but that's more CPG specific, but that's one way to go beyond purchase intent. Now the key that I'm hoping for is more data partners going beyond the CPG vertical. So how can I take that methodology and scale it out against, let's say, retail, big, big box, um, or other categories? So where more of my clients, not just CPG kind of clients, can leverage that methodology. Mm -hmm. So how can, I ma how can I match against credit card sales data, or how can I, man how can I match against other sales data? for non-CPG categories, because that would be great. 
I can very clearly match my media plan with exposure, mm -hmm. match it mm -hmm. to cells, but right now it's more, most scalable for CPG. What, what about other non-CPG categories? Sure, sure. Um, and that would be the ideal way because it's very transparent, very clear. There just needs to be more scalable solutions in that regard. And then the th third method, which is more around what happens when I can't get ma uh, sales matchbacks, but I do have a long-term campaign. So what happens if I have, and this is something that I have right now, a campaign that's a year and a half, or a campaign we have plenty of weeks worth of data, mm -hmm. and you can actually start building trends around it. My cross-media data will very cleanly tell me my exposure lifts, and it'll tell me what's happening within the plan. Fantastic. But now that I have these long-term trends, and as long as they're stable, I can then essentially, what I like to do is, um, I'm a big proponent of looking at um, search as an indirect variable. Mm -hmm. And this is one piece to where I've been using uh, Google Trends data very successfully to just go in. It's, it's great because it's publicly available. It's, um, it has a, a great syntax. In other words, like the categories they cover are you know, very representative. But also, I've seen that when I look at sales numbers, the correlations are actually pretty nice. Now, it's not, gonna always go, it's not always gonna work. You, know, there, there's a, you actually need to have somebody that can model this for you. But I've seen very nicely that my cross-media results, so the more I'm advertising, the more I'm seeing awareness, very obvious correlations. But okay. it's, it's a built-in hypothesis that you wanna try to validate because what I'm trying to do and what I've done is I've taken things to where you actually have your trend of increases in needed awareness, increases in consideration from your survey data, mm -hmm. but then I've, I've gotten those things to actually v match against the trends in search because they make sense that increases in awareness or increases in advertising are building messaging and favorability in the marketplace, attentiveness essentially, and as you're building consideration, you're actually seeing changes in search. And it makes sense for certain categories where, you know, if you, so long as your category has a built-in assumption that you know people are gonna research your product online, mm -hmm. it makes fantastic sense. Because then I can see changes and increases in my, you know, in my brand metrics, also correlating to increases and changes in search terms, which can also then be correlated to sales terms. And once you build that into a model, you can use search trends data as a nice indirect predictor that can tie from awareness to sales data. Mm -hmm. But that's one way to where, what happens, you know, if you actually need to do this on, on your, in your project tomorrow, and you do have nice cross-media data that's stranded over long periods of time, I think it's, you know, as an analyst, I, I like playing with, that with the Google Trends data um, because it's, it's a it's really nice way to kind of see what's happening behaviorally in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that gets into leading to, into doing those more mixed models. Um, right. but, but essentially, those, those are the three things that I like to uh, take approach. If it's time sensitive, just do a purchase question um, for, for, you know, self-stated purchase activity. Mm -hmm. If I have a database panel, then I can try to match it but I try to make sure that I can, you know, what I need is more scalable methods mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to cover more categories. And the third one is just, you know, do some econometric analysis where you're using Google search data as an indirect variable. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. lots of different approaches, lots of different methodologies. I love every single one of them because the more that we push into this approach, the more that we can get scalable solutions. And that's the real key that I worry less about which approach has the better methodology. Mm -hmm. I worry about there's not enough scale. Because I'm willing, to, I'm willing to, to actually work with four or five different studies that have you know, different ranges of you know, accuracy. Mm -hmm. But the fact that there, if there's more scale, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to test those. Because that's the one piece to where there's just not enough scalable solutions to really kind of put all this stuff into context. Again, if I just want to care about TV and nothing else, then lots of really cool solutions. Right. Fantastic. But when I need to put all this stuff together, so TV, like right now, you know, I, I see a lot of cool things happening with TV and like social TV. So mm -hmm. TV plus social, that's great. But TV plus web plus mobile plus social, that's where it gets a little bit trickier. Right. Um, but it's really more data-driven um, television uh, exposure data in the context of the overall cross media. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a really cool, cool and interesting thing. And then the other one is uh, when it comes to, um, to social is just more scalable tracking of the media exposure, that's difficult. Because what I, the things that I find more interesting is I want to understand the causal relationships of, or at least meter a little bit better, the passive understanding of social. So when people say, well, what's my pay to earn index? If I buy 10 million impressions, what's the likelihood that I'll, like, what's my index? If, if I'm going to have, for every paid impression, I'll get two for free because it's a really great creative ad. Mm -hmm. that, that's the basic one. But then I want to go further and say, when I have all my cross media type, you know, measured and exposured, I want to understand that if my lift from, let's say, if my lift from TV is, let's say, 12, so versus control group, I have a 12% uh, lift, what would be the indirect effect of social? 
Maybe it's a case that social is going to give TV from a 12 to a 17% delta. But I need better ways to kind of scale it out. Mm -hmm. so that I, and, and the first way is just better exposure tracking of social data so that I can then go back and say, wouldn't it be nice to, to then go and say that your cross-media effects are really amplified when you have social? Because social may not necessarily always be a direct effect. So what is the indirect effect of social in relationship to your regular cross-media studies? Mm -hmm. And that's, it may sound a little bit simplistic just to say, well, you know, it's just a little bu extra bump in the bar chart. But setting up the mechanisms to really do it well at scale, because you and I could do it if it was client-specific or publisher-specific, if it's just one thing. But having it scalable across different accounts with different providers, um, and you know, with my client base, I would need to worry about each kind of vertical in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. George, you've given us a lot to chew on, and we've covered a lot of ground. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate it. And that concludes this episode of Research TV. I'm Mark Dresner, and you've just heard the Insight Scoop. 